all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion today uh, about epstein bar virus the reason for that is that david <laughs> my friend david who's here in san jose and who's from israel he had sent me a study which is very interesting and that study showed it's a small study that study showed that epstein bar virus was reactivated or activated in some patients who were long haulers and so i wanted to make sure so in there the the authors or researchers had postulated that maybe the long haul symptoms are actually the activated epstein bar virus symptoms so i thought i'll discuss that study but to discuss that study they had done the serology and profiles on the patients and we had to understand how the serology works and to understand the serology we had to understand how infectious mononucleosis work so <laughs> this is my true way of earning coffee so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to start a three uh, uh, topic three uh, lecture series today we'll talk about infectious mononucleosis and the introduction to epstein bar virus and the pathophysiology of the epstein bar virus and the diagnosis and management of infectious mononucleosis so we'll talk about that today tomorrow we'll talk about the serology and what makes the serology why are some antibodies increased at some point and others at another point and then on monday we'll talk about that study and connect all these three lectures together so this is the plan let's start our discussion i hope you're all doing well here is the screen share <clears throat> so these are the gifts for humanity these are the references here so this is dr bean medical this is epstein bar virus again if you don't like wikipedia you can read it from wherever you like these are for me easy to provide references to because they are available and accessible to everyone this is also epstein bar virus actually this is infectious mononucleosis this is another topic about the ebv this here is ebv with with serology this is ebv serology and some of the important topics there and this is the downy cell and what are the downy cell this these are the references on the clinical side the discussion that i'm doing the most important reference here from clinical point of view and i'll stay with the textbook and not go in the research with the ebv the textbook that i'm using is the current medical diagnosis and treatment 2016 lange so that is the textbook the microbiology books that i'm using are number 1 medical microbiology 8th edition number 2 javits and number 3 medical Uh, microbiology made ridiculously simple these are the book references and now let's start our discussion so epstein bar virus is a double stranded dna virus so ds dna virus we have been talking about sars cov 2 which is a positive sense rna virus this is a double stranded dna virus this virus is enveloped as well so that means it also has a, a membrane if you can say around it just like sars cov 2 this virus is called hhv4 or herpes virus v4 so this is a human herpes virus type this virus is the most common in humans and that is why i think all of us over here know about this so this must not be a virus that is unique to us mono that the glandular disease with fever which normally occurs in schools when children start kissing each other and swapping saliva is usually the because of the um, uh, epstein bar virus although it is not necessary that somebody has to kiss and exchange saliva to have saliva this virus actually spreads through saliva or it can spread through sexual contact as well and saliva can be touched by if let's say somebody touched their their mouth and then they touched a surface where somebody else touched and then touched their mouth so it is not necessary that it is always kissing but that is the most common route so this is also called a kissing disease or glandular fever fever with glands swollen or simply mono 95% of the adults 
are supposed to be in the US, 90 to 95 percent of the adults are supposed to have mono, not mono, Epstein Barr virus present in them. It persists in us for lifetime. And I'll discuss more later on. This is a summary of it. The causes, this, this virus causes infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever. I just talked about it. This virus is also associated with, in, for example, African countries, it is associated with lymphoproliferative diseases like Burkitt's lymphoma. And you would see that this virus has a very interesting programming it does of the B cells. It can make them immortal. In addition to the B cell, it can do that to T cells and NK cells as well. More importantly, NK cells. And because of that, some cells can become immortal and continue to replicate forever, converting into cancer cells. So, for example, in Africa, it can cause Burkitt's lymphoma. In Southeast Asian people, it can cause other lympho lymphoproliferative disorders or cancers as well, Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin. Non in addition to that, this virus has been associated with gastric cancers and with nasopharyngeal carcinomas, nasopharyngeal carcinomas. So quite a lot of uh, uh, carcinomas as well. And we will see the reason why this virus causes the B cells to become blast cells, meaning they continue to divide and they just keep dividing. They keep proliferating. And that is how they can develop a tendency to become um, cancerous as well. Now, that was a quick thing about the virus. We'll go more deep into the virus properties later on. The, the infection that it causes, infectious mononucleosis. Remember, the infectious mononucleosis has nothing to do with the monocyte cells. It is actually a disease caused by Epstein-Barr virus, primarily of the B cells of the immune system. So usually occurs in the school going age, but it can actually occur in smaller children as well. Most of the time when it is in the sw smaller children, it is asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. And small children can actually become an important route of spread as well because they can drool on toys and, and surfaces where they are playing and they can then cause uh, EBV to be shed on surfaces. And for example, in a nursery where one child is has, let's say, EBV and they're playing with toys and they have drooled on the toy and another child comes and plays with it and now they have touch that saliva and then it transmits to them from there then to their family and so on. So children have it too. Important thing, incubation time. Incubation time is that when the virus enters the body, from there the time when it produces the symptoms, this virus can have an incubation time for 30 to 50 days, one to two months. That means if I got mono today, not mono, EBV today, it may be one to two months when I develop symptoms. So that is a long incubation time. That also allows the virus to then continue to shed for a larger period of time. The other interesting thing, and I'll show you that, saliva is infectious. And here is the important thing. Even when the symptoms have subsided of the mono, so Epstein-Barr virus infected somebody, let's say me, then uh, I got the symptoms, then the symptoms got resolved, then it is possible that the person would continue to shed Epstein-Barr virus in their saliva. So their saliva would stay infectious for up to six months or more. So that means using each other's toothbrush or let's say some two folks came together, they just became friends and they became more closer friends, they started dating, they started being together, and they started using each other's toothbrush. It is possible a person who had mono four months ago might still have their saliva having EBV in it. So it can be six months or more that the um, shedding in saliva continues to occur or the saliva is infectious. So here the start is or the exposure started. One to two months is the, um, what is that, incubation time, then the acute infection time. Then after the uh, convalescence, 
start of the symptoms to six months or more after saliva can be infectious. Now, what are the symptoms for mono? And this is important because some of these symptoms, if you see, are going to be similar to SARS-CoV-2 long haul as well. So that is why the researchers researched and they came back and they said, we think that the long haul symptoms in a few people are because they are EBV symptoms and not really anything else. So that means our discussion of how long haul occurs, where we say mast cell activation or macrophage activation or monocyte continuous activation, Dr. Bruce Patterson, we can add one more uh, thing to it, and that is the, the reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. We also have talked about a study where we talked about abnormal blood cells. So there are multiple pathologies that come together to give rise to similar symptoms of long haul. So here, what are the symptoms of mono? The, the most important triad, triad is the three symptoms, uh, exudative pharyngitis. So pharynx has, if you look on the pharynx of the throat, there are whitish exudative plaques in there. So exudative pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy. So we all know that uh, swollen lymph nodes and glands, parotid gland swells up. The retro, the, the posterior cervical chain becomes swollen as well, or the, the lymph nodes on the side of the neck. Then splenomegaly, the uh, spleen can become um, a, uh, enlarged as well. So these are important triad, triad of symptoms that if you see signs and symptoms, you, sh you should start thinking it is mono. Other than that, fever, headache, malaise. This is very, very common. People become very tired. Malaise, sore throat, anorexia, they don't want to eat. There may even be difficulty in breathing because of the swollen lymph nodes and swollen throat and hurting throat and so on. If you look in, in the throat, you will see white exudates and tonsils. You would see exudative pharyngitis as well. So there is tonsillitis, there is pharyngitis. Then there could be leukoplakia. So a side of the tongue may have white plaques on it. Lip edema may occur as well. Then, as I discussed, exudative pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly as well, liver enlargement can occur as well. Now, splenomegaly is important because most of the time mono occurs in youngsters. So young athletes who have mono, and if they continue to play their games, especially contact games, that might end up causing splenic rupture. So it is important for the youngsters or anyone who has mono and who may be doing physical exertion or phys uh, such activities that might cause physical contact with others or with machinery that they should be careful because that can cause splenic rupture. Maculopapular rash. So there could be a rash on the whole trunk and body which is raised red colored rashes. There could be conjunctival hemorrhages. So if you look in the eye, you could see hemorrhage in the white of the eye. Exudative pharyngitis, uvular edema. So the, the uvula, the, that central thing that is that closes the nasal pharynx when we are eating or talking, that is swollen, tonsillitis occurs, and then exudate in the pharynx and occur. In addition to that, in some cases, not all, encephalitis can occur. That is the swelling of the brain. Cerebellitis can occur. That would cause a problem with the uh, repeated movements. That would cause problem with the straight walk. That would cause problem with the muscle tone uh, uh, management. Transverse myelitis or swelling of the spinal cord and even Guillain-Barre syndrome. These can all occur because of mono. And you can see that some of them are actually common for long haulers as well. There can be optic neuritis as well. There can be myocarditis, pericarditis, plural inv inv involvement, 
lung involvement, interstitial pneumonitis. Now, please pay attention to this one. This is interstitial pneumonitis, not the uh, typical pneumonia. Interstitial pneumonitis will mean atypical pneumonia, which is usually viral. And what happens is that there is pneumonia or inflammation outside of the alveoli. This is why we call it walking pneumonia as well. Gastritis can occur, nephritis or uh, swelling inside the kidney tissue. And that also is interstitial, not the nephrons or the functional part of the kidney, but the tissue, connective tissue of the kidney. Life-threatening thrombocytopenia can occur. So these are the um, signs and symptoms. Now the question, again, we are we're going to do three talks. Today, mononucleosis is an overall bigger pathophysiology. Tomorrow, serology. And then Monday, we'll connect it with the study that is about the long haulers. So here, pathology overview. This is the Epstein-Barr virus. So if you see here, <laughs> so this is my drawing of the Ep Epstein-Barr virus. It has a viral envelope. It has these spiky things that we know from SARS-CoV-2 as spikes, SARS-CoV-2 S proteins. These are envelope proteins. Then inside the envelope is the tagment of the virus or matrix of the virus. Imagine that we have a sphere, a ball. Inside the ball is another ball. So that other ball is the tagment or the matrix. Then inside is the double-stranded DNA. And covering the DNA is the nucleocapsid. And we know that this is a kind of a structure for majority of the viruses, that they have their genetic material. That genetic material is, is uh, uh, protected by nucleocapsid. Now, some viruses have an envelope, some do not. Now, how does it infect and work? So this is a very clever virus, more clever than SARS-CoV-2. Let's look at some of the things. When we'll do serology tomorrow, we'll do even deeper dive further. But let's see how does it infect us. So normally, the infection starts from the throat. So the saliva after kissing a person or saliva which was present on some surface and ended up somehow in our mouth because we touched that surface and touched our mouth, whatever is the route. Imagine that if EBV virus has ended up in my mouth or in a person's mouth. Most commonly, the EBV will connect with epithelial cells here in my throat or the B cells here. And the reason for that is Epstein-Barr virus has a very specific need for certain receptors, CD21 receptors, to bind with. Because of that, it cannot bind with every tissue. It can only bind with those cells that exhibit that receptor, just like SARS-CoV-2 needs ACE2. Similarly, Epstein-Barr virus needs CD21. And because of this, we, we call this as a tissue tropism or viral tropism. This virus needs a specific tissue to work on. So here it can work on the epithelial cell. It binds there with the BMRF2 receptors or the glycoprotein. So if you go back here on this surface are glycoproteins. They're called GPs. Glycoproteins are what? They are proteins, that is amino acid, with glycose on them or with glucose on them or with carbohydrates in them. So they are carbohydrate plus protein together. Protein is muscle. So tiny microscopic muscles with sugars on them. So these are glycoproteins. So the virus connects with the epithelial cell. On the epithelial cell, there is beta-1 integrin that is used. And on the virus, there is BMRF2. Similarly, this is important. B cells, B cells present in this area. And these B cells may be on the surface of the area. Remember that at the border of the throat, we have a heavy presence of military and army and defense forces. Those are the ones that are present in tonsils, which become less important or even useless as adults. We become adults. They even become area where pathogens hide because they're not functional. But the, this whole area at that border is filled with 
immune system cells to protect us from any bad pathogens which are going to land in our mouth and then go into our body. So at this border, at this barrier, we have a lot of immune defense systems. So there we have lots of B cells sitting there too. So the Epstein-Barr virus can connect with the B cell through two receptors. First, it connects with CD21. And that is GP350 of the virus connects with CD21. CD21, this is interesting, is actually a receptor for complement system. So, so Epstein-Barr virus uses that receptor to its advantage. Once it connects there, then it's GP42 or glycoprotein number 42, another receptor, combines with MHC2. Remember MHC2? MHC2 are the major histocompatibility complexes or proteins that are present on the surface of professional antigen presenting cells, which are dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. So here it connects with the B cells MHC2. These two bindings, this is like if I connect or bind with something with my one hand and the other hand and I hold it and then I fuse with it. That's what this virus does. It holds the cell with two hands and then it fuses with the cell. Once it fuses, it would inject its DSDNA and then the DSDNA or, or the genetic material would do the rest of the thing. So this is fusion. Now, once the virus is inside a cell, this virus can be in multiple states. One state is called replication. So imagine in my mouth, the virus landed. Now it is infected at an epithelial cell or the surface cell of the throat area or a B cell. Once it is in there, it is going to start replicating or increasing in number. We had done this discussion, I remember about a year ago or more, that SARS-CoV-2, when that infects a cell, it is not necessary that it always destroys the cell when it comes out. But there are some viruses which will always destroy the cell from which they will emerge. Imagine if a bunch of criminals entered a house. In there, they made more and more babies. And when there were too many babies, they broke the house open and came out. That is called lytic replication. Lytic means, lytic is from lysis and lysis is breakdown. So lytic replication or productive replication. Why we call it productive? Because the cell in which the virus has gone is going to give a lots of new cells there. So this is a production phase for the virus. So in the case of lytic replication, the virus enters the cell, as we saw before, how. And once it is in there, it starts increasing in numbers. When it increases in number, it breaks down the cell itself, causing damage. And the virus, the daughter vir virion, they come out. Then they'll go into the next cell, and they'll continue to do this. And that is how the damage occurs. So this part, this way of this virus's activity is called lytic replication. This happens both in epithelial cells and B cells as well. The only interesting thing is that when the virus infects the B cell, or sorry, epithelial cells, it can start lytic replication right away in them. So that means it would start damaging the tissue right away. But the B cells, it cannot start doing lytic replication right away normally. Normally, it goes in the B cells and sleeps. And when that virus is reactivated in the B cell, then it can most commonly start causing lytic replication. So there is slight difference in how it may infect and cause lysis of the cell. But still, at the end of the day, B cells will break down and epithelial cells will break down. These infected B cells from the throat will pick up the virus and then they will become active and they'll become uh, dividing as well and they will run around in the whole body. This is our immune cells behavior. When they find some antigen, they run around in the body and give that antigen or bring it to every other cell and say, look, I got something. And in that process, because the virus is hiding in them, B cells actually become a carrier and spreader of the virus in the body. 
So now they are taking the B cells. They are taking the virus to different lymph nodes. They are taking it to the spleen, to the liver, and wherever they go, they are actually going to cause more infection there because they themselves are infected. So that is a problem. Now remember here, this is not a B cell acting as an antigen presenting cell. This is a B cell that got infected by the pathogen. It's a victim, this B cell. It's not deliberately and happily eating up a pathogen to break it down and to show it to others. It actually got targeted by the pathogen that has infected it. So this is just like any other regular cell which becomes infected. Now, the second type of activity that this virus does is called latency. Latency is very interesting. What it does is, so imagine this is the virus here. In latency, the virus enters the cell. Most of the time, it does latency with B cell. But it can do latency with epithelial cells as well. And the latency are three types of latencies, 3, 2, and 1. In B cells, the virus causes latency of type 3, 2, and 1. In epithelial cells, it can only cause latency of 3 and 2. So let's look at what that is to see what is the difference. So here is a B cell got infected by the Epstein-Barr virus. As soon as it got infected by it, the Epstein-Barr virus here, it, it lives there like an episome or a plasmid. What is a plasmid? A plasmid is nothing but a circular DNA material present in our cells. Or uh, normally, bacteria have plasmids. Remember, we've been talking about bacteria having superpowers. For example, some bacteria learn to resist antibiotics. So how do they learn to resist? Do they go and read a book and say, all right, now I know how to beat penicillin? No, they actually acquire genetic material that teaches them to make enzymes or structural changes to defeat the antibiotic. Those pieces of DNA material that give them superpowers, those recipes, those voodoo magic things are called plasmids. And bacteria can actually connect with each other and transmit the copies of plasmid from one bacteria to other. So bacteria can teach each other how to um, how to protect themselves and become super. Similarly here, this virus is present in the B cell. In there, the viral DNA is present in a circular structure, and that is the episome or the plasmid. This DNA structure, if all of this viral DNA is working, all components of the virus are functioning, all enzymes of the virus are produced, then we'll say this virus is active. And what does it do to the B cell? It tells the B cell, it whispers it to the B cell and says, hey, B cell, become active. Start proliferating. Become a blast cell. Make more copies of yourself. I need you to increase in number. And when the B cell is increasing in number, with that, the viral DNA is getting copied as well. And that is also increasing in number. This is what is called, plus this virus tells the B cell not to cause apoptosis. Our cells have a behavior that if they find a problem inside of them and they think that I cannot take care of this problem, I cannot defend against it, then the cell kills itself. That is called apoptosis. This virus makes enzymes that block the apoptotic proteins in the B cells. And for, for all of us, the apoptotic proteins, I've been talking about caspases. So caspases are protein like Casper the ghost. The caspases are proteins that work with ubiquitins and then that causes a cell to die. If a cell has caspases activated and ubiquitins ac ac activated in a cell, that cell dies. This virus and the enzymes produced by the virus block the cell from making caspases or activating caspases or ubiquitins. That means this cell, even when it knows I am damaged inside, I have EBV inside, it cannot commit suicide. 
it cannot kill itself. Now, this has become an immortal cell. Sometimes these immortal cells convert into cancers. This is why cytomegalovirus or the Epstein-Barr virus have a tendency to produce cancers because they teach the B cells to become immortal. So now these B cells that are immortal B cells, some of them will go to bone marrow and start living there. Just like we, we saw with the SARS-CoV-2 as well, that some of the SARS-CoV-2 memory cells will go to bone marrow and live there forever, correct? Similarly here, some of these bees, how many cells? One out of every 100,000 or one out of every million cell. These infected B cells will actually be killed by the immune system. They are regular cells. It doesn't matter that they are B cells. It doesn't matter that they are part of the immune system. If they got infected, our immune system is going to kill them. So majority of these infected B cells will be killed. But out of every 100,000 or a million, one cell would survive, which will go in the bone marrow and live there. That order came from the Epstein-Barr virus to say, hey, man, become immortal, survive, run away from here, from the throat, go to the bone marrow and start living there. So this is the type 3 latency. Then is the type 2 latency. In the type 2 latency, the same B cell, let's say this was a B cell. This B cell had this plasmid in it or circular genetic material of the Epstein-Barr virus. This is such a cute thing, a dangerous thing as well. Now what this virus is doing is the virus plasmid turns off many of its genes. So this is like, you know, some criminal going into a street where they're going to do something and they bring their car there and they turn it off. So nobody can listen to them anymore. So this plasmid now turns off some of its genes and only enough genes are functioning to create a set of enzymes that whisper to the B cell to say, hey, B cell, become a memory cell. So this latent stage of the virus has the whole virus DNA in the, in the cell, but it is now asking the cell to become a memory cell. This memory cell will then keep the viral DNA in it and live in us forever. That is why once we get mono, we get it forever. And this plus the latent stage three, the cells produced here that end up in the bone marrow are the ones that keep Epstein-Barr virus with us forever. And one proof of that was that there was a study, there was a observation actually, where they saw that those people who had Epstein-Barr virus and then were given bone marrow transplant from people who did not have Epstein-Barr virus, which I wonder who they are, <laughs> they never kissed someone, I guess. They found out that the person who received the bone marrow, they also became negative for Epstein-Barr virus. That means their own bone marrow had the Epstein-Barr virus laden B cell. It's not the full virus, just the plasmid, the genetic material of the virus is in them, not the whole virus. And when the when the bone marrow was transplanted from another person that did not have the Epstein-Barr virus, then this person became Epstein-Barr virus free as well. So this just proves that the B cells go in the bone marrow and live there with the plasmid or genetic material of the Epstein-Barr virus. So this is called latent stage two or two type two latency. Then is the type one latency. Type 1 latency is the next stage of becoming dormant and hidden. In this stage, even more genes are turned off. So even the lights are turned off. Even the persons are breathing low now. And what is the virus producing now? Virus is just producing enough enzymes that whenever the cell divides, with that cell, the virus divides as well. They, they make just one enzyme. That enzyme is EBNA1. And we use that to understand if the virus is present or not. EBNA1 
virus, Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen 1, that enzyme is produced in the latent stage 1, which is the last latent stage, which only helps the virus plasmid to be replicated when the parent cell or the B cell replicates as well. <laughs> so this, this, this clever virus, right? So what happens is these viruses then, it's not viruses, these cells, can then in the future be reactivated. They can be reactivated by any infection that would activate the B cells. And when they would activate the B cell, they'll, how do we activate a B cell? We connect with the B cell and then we produce cytokines to activate it. Here, let's say some other infection occurred, SARS-CoV-2 occurred, cytomegalovirus occurred, some other infection occurred, which caused these B cells to accidentally become active as well. Now we'll have reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus. Actually, we still are not clear how Epstein-Barr virus becomes reactivated. We know some of the mechanisms, but not all. In some people, it becomes reactivated, produces more cell with more plasmids or the virus genetic material in them, and then it becomes silent again. So all it does is, does is every few months or years, it makes more daughters and then goes to sleep again then wakes up in another few years, makes more daughters and goes to sleep again. It keeps a balanced quantity of itself in a person's body so it is not eliminated. That is how clever this virus is. So it can be reactivated and once it is reactivated, it can cause infection as well. Now these infected B cells cause T cell to become activated. And how do, I mean, we, we know this mechanism. Imagine B cell is infected. That means on the surface of the B cell, it would present the antigen. That means a naive T cell will connect with the B cell and say, what the heck, man, you are sick. Naive T cell will become activated and that would activate T helper two pathway, which would act activate some other B cells that are going to be against this virus plus it can activate the naive T cell, can convert into T helper one as well, that would activate cytotoxic T cells. So what happens is when these B cells are infected, cytotoxic T cells are activated in large numbers. And these active T cells are found in the bloodstream. So when you do a peripheral blood picture, you will see big lymphocytes with big cytoplasms and big nucleus and active. These are called downy cells after the researcher who found them. And he found them with the cytomegalovirus as well. So they are called reactivated T cells and they are called downy cells. Another interesting thing, this I think you would really have a kick out of this one. This B cell that got, that got infected. Now remember we have done this discussion in the past as well that B cells make receptors to bind with antigen, correct? And every B cell makes um, a receptor to bind with a specific pattern or epitope. Here, when the B cell is infected, the virus causes the proliferation and the enzymes of the virus cause this B cell to become blast cell, an active cell. A blast cell means it's a new cell. It's going to make more cells. And those cells can have various kinds of antibody structures in them or the genetic material to make antibodies because there is somatic hypermutation. Or simply, every daughter cell that is formed usually have the same pattern to attach with the same antibody, antigen. But in this case, B cell would start making weird antibodies. Those antibodies are actually not against this pathogen. They are just because we are tickling the B cell so much that it is giggling and laughing and just making whatever antibodies it can. These antibodies are called heterophile antibodies. They do not attack this pathogen, but they are an indicator of a sick B cell. So just imagine a giggling B cell sitting somewhere in our throat and just giggling and throwing the antibodies out, those antibodies are of no use. 
They're just spilling out of it because it is laughing. And these are called heterophile antibodies. We can detect them. And if we detect them, we know it is Epstein-Barr virus tickling this B cell. These set of symptoms, sore throat, exudative tonsillitis, the glandular things, fever, these, this set of symptoms can occur by other viruses too. Cytomegalovirus can do it. Even acute HIV does it. So then how do you differentiate EBV from them? You can do heterophile antibodies and they do not have heterophile antibodies. This one has. Although heterophile antibodies is always not most accurate, it is not very specific and sensitive test. But still, if it is negative, then that rules out EBV with, with the serology. So this is a very, very interesting thing. Now let's continue to see. I hope you're enjoying this uh, little talk about the, the naughty Epstein-Barr virus. Now, how do we diagnose it? Number one, we look for heterophile antibodies that I just did. That is a monospot test, normally quickly done to kind of at least have an idea that is this person suffering mono. Then there can be serology as well. That would take multiple days. But in this, we can see various antibodies that are generated against the virus and parts of the virus. And for various phases, various parts are made. And based on that, doctor can also see that is this an active infection or a past infection and so on. You know that IgM will be an active infection and IgG will be in a past infection. IgM can be in reactivation as well. So I'm going to talk about these tomorrow, that what are the antibodies? They are targeted against what part of the virus and what part of the virus or enzyme of the virus is active at what stage. So, but serology can be done. Then blood tests, for example, it is seen that the very first week or very first day, few days, granulocytopenia occurs. Granulocyte, eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, um, neutrophils, they start going down in number. Then after that, lymphocytic lymphocytosis occurs. So lymphocyte number increases. And mostly that, that is the B cells and T cells. Then hemolytic anemia occurs. Red blood cells start breaking down. And the reason for that is that spleen is swollen and the liver is swollen and the function there is not correct. So the blood starts breaking down. And then thrombocytopenia occurs. So the number of thrombocytes, they reduce in number, sometimes life-threateningly. Now the differential diagnosis of the EPV. Cytomegalovirus can cause similar symptoms. Toxoplasmosis can cause similar symptoms. Acute HIV cause these symptoms. Secondary syphilis, H HV6, rubella, drug hypersensitivity reactions. And now, after we'll discuss this um, SARS-CoV-2, it is possible that even SARS-CoV-2 may have similar, some of the um, symptoms may be similar. Now for the acute exudative tonsillitis, meaning and pharyngitis, the sore throat part. That could be, if it is exudative, that means you can see those whitish, yellowish plaques on pharynx and the, and the tonsils. That could be gonococcal or streptococcal um, infection. There could be adenovirus infection. There could be herpes simplex infection. So there are some other pathogens that would do that too. And then finally, Last part of the topic today, management. How do we manage it? So monos, because it's a viral, <laughs> you, would, you would laugh because I'm going to say supportive management, just like we've been saying for SARS-CoV-2, supportive management. Just, just have the patient sit back at home and drink lots of water and do supportive paracetamol and other things. So that is what is here as well. Supportive management, non-steroidal anti um, uh, what is that? Anti-inflammatory drugs, warm saline throat gargles, rest, hydration, treat the complications. Acyclovir, which is an antiviral, has shown to reduce the viral shedding. That means virus going to others or shedding in the saliva, but no clinical benefit to the patient itself. So kind of remdesivir for SARS-CoV-2. Steroids. 
are actually very commonly used for mono, but they are not recommended for mono if it is if the mono is uncomplicated. If there are complications, then steroids can be used. Penicillin and azithromycin can be used for beta hemolytic streptococci if they are the ones that are in the throat. Ampicillin and amoxicillin should be avoided because they can cause a rash and we know that mono itself can cause a rash as well. So then you will not have an idea of it. They can be mixed up. So this is the discussion for today. This is the first part of the discussion. Tomorrow, we look at the serology. We look at various parts of the virus and how our body makes antibodies against them. How do the antibodies increase and reduce? And what is the ac acute phase, latent phase, reactivation phase? And then on Monday, we will talk about the study that uses this information to discuss long haul COVID and reactivation of uh, Epstein-Barr virus. So with this, thank you very much. Do me a favor. <laughs> That's a fancy glove. So I use this glove for drawing so that I don't, um, you know, it's it makes it easy to draw on this uh, this tablet. So please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. You can use PayPal to support it. You can buy me a coffee, or you can be a patron. And I would see you in a few minutes.